I am so pleased that I have um, managed to get Sarah and Nick to, to be with us. I mean, they're both wonderful friends and wonderful philosophers. Um, and first off, uh, first of all, we're going to hear from Dr. Sarah Hagenbart, who is a postdoctoral lecturer, Wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin at the Technische Universität in Munich. Um, Sarah is really one of these philosophers who I admire for being able to sit on two chairs between art history and philosophy. You're now in an art history department. Um, so Sarah completed her PhD at the Courtauld Institute under the supervision of Professor Sarah Wilson. She has worked as a curator on many exciting projects, including as a curator of art at Pembroke College at the University of Oxford and at the German Embassy. She has also worked as the Associate Lecturer at the Courtauld Institute before joining the Technical University in Munich. Her dissertation from Bayreuth to Burkina Faso, Christoph Schlingensief Opera Village, Africa as Postcolonial post Gesamtkunstwerk, looks at this um, interesting German artist, Christoph Schlingensief, and his relationship to Africa. Uh, she has published on um, both uh, philosophical issues, issues of post-colonial art and socially engaged art in many different venues. I'm going to keep these introductions relatively short. So you can look her up, of course, online. And today she's going to talk to us about art and its freedom to be political. So, Sarah, welcome. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction and for the invitation um, to be here, actually, which I enjoy very much. And also, um, having had this wonderful tour yesterday. Um, I'm just going to uh, yes. make this a bit more of our size. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Um, I really feel that we are at a very political place here because it might not be as bit said, like kind of an openly formulated political masters, but I think by stepping back from our everyday reality, by allowing us to engage with artworks that really force us to take on new perspectives, we are doing something which is essential for the exercise of democratic citizenship, and that's something I will talk about today, like the relation between freedom, art, and political um, exercises. And um, I'll start by saying I don't think that all art is propaganda. Actually, I, I reject the idea that actually art should be propaganda. But I don't think I d disagree with um, Web Dubois because I think what he actually meant, meant is that all art is political art. Um, and just maybe to um, say why I have a pro problem with the idea that art is something like propaganda, I think propaganda lacks the freedom and ambiguity that I consider as constitutive for something to count as art. So it might be a bit surprising that I'm then arguing that all art is political. But by political, I mean that art comprises features that are constitutive for exercising democratic citizenship. To be more precise, I believe that all art allows us to exercise freedom. So that's a very new idea here I want to try out and discuss with you, but I really believe that maybe freedom could count as an aesthetic and political value. Well, freedom, in addition to equality, solidarity, and justice, is essential political value. I will argue that freedom also manifests an aesthetic value. Freedom as feature of an artwork therefore allows us to distinguish good art from bad art. My suspicion is um, that freedom is an experiential value rather than an aesthetic property. That means that it's part of the aesthetic experience that it constitutes aesthetic value. In order to make this claim, a more nuanced distinction between different types of art and freedom might be necessary. So I'll start with this. So in order to differentiate art as propaganda from political art, it needs to be clear that political art does not limit the autonomy of art, whereas art as propaganda does. If art is used as propaganda, it pursues the implementation of a clearly defined political agenda. So I brought some examples, um, famous baby Trump, you might all know from the protests in England. Um, I think that's a wonderful work of activist art, um, something maybe like propaganda, because it has and pursues a clear political message, but I don't think it's art. Um, another example is um, this mural by the Imbamba Collective, a collective based in South Africa, and they were fighting the apartheid regime. Also there, um, 
I don't think it's kind of um, very clearly defined propaganda, but I doubt that it's art either, because the message is still quite clear. They want to fight the apartheid regime. So it's something in between kind of political art and propaganda. But I think there are artworks um, which have, have a message or kind of um, try to convey something um, that is political, but are not um, propaganda. So you might have um, followed this performance by Sesam Bil um an artist, black artist from South Africa, and she performed as a shipanga, like a specific bird, um, during the removal of the road sculpture, which you see in the background. So she was part of the protest, Roads Must Fall, in South Africa. So I think there are artworks that don't prescribe a clear political message, but invite you to engage with really pressing um, political topics. So one might think also of environmental art, um, this is a work by Olan Rewayu Tiyoso, who is a Nigerian artist, and it was exhibited during the um, Dakar Biennial um, in 2017. So my definition of political art, as you might have suspected, is quite broad, because I think um, political artworks, and that are the artworks I'm interested in today, are artworks that encourage you to exercise skills or virtues that are relevant um, to the exercise and improvement of democratic citizenship. And I will adopt an argument by Juliane Rebentisch today to argue for art's freedom to be political, because initially it sounds like a counterintuitive claim, because if we believe that art ought to be autonomous, then political art might be viewed as diminishing this kind of autonomous nature of an artwork. Art's political power, I propose, is very subtle and nuanced rather than explicit and propagandistic, and therefore expresses art's autonomy rather than limiting its freedom. And I think if we compare the works which I view as kind of political works because they force you to engage um, certain virtues or like kind of skills you have um, in order that, that are also needed or transferable to the engagement or exercise of virtues that you need in order to be an active political um, citizen, then we might find like a lot of works here at the Sculpture Park, which were also obviously inspired by abstract artworks like Louise Nevelson here, um, sculpture, female sculpture, um, that's a book I want to talk about. But I briefly wanted to um, just kind of, and, and a work I inserted yesterday because I was so impressed by the sculpture, just briefly um, relate this to a claim or a statement I found um, Jeffrey Rubinoff made in 2010 as um, during the introduction to the company of a dear for ideas forum. And there he learned what I learned was that to be able to measure the inherent value of an artist's works is to be able to accept each artist's perception of the extent of the sum of all human knowledge in the artist's time. So original art is created beyond the limits of that extent and informs rather than reflects. And the bold um, is kind of something I added. Um, because I found this so interesting and I, I really felt that there are parallels to Juliane Rebentisch ideas, that um, art is something that pushes us to exceed beyond our limits in order to take on new information, new knowledge, new ideas. Um, and this pushing beyond our limits is freedom, right? This is something I want to discuss today um, with regard to Juliane Rebentisch's argument that's based on Plato, actually, who was very critical of the arts and kind of scared, actually. Um, so let's go back to Rebentisch. So she is saying in The Art of Freedom on the dialectics of democratic existence, um, by, by contrast, in democracy, a dialectic, of, a dialectic of freedom penetrates both spheres, ethics and politics, and sets them in motion. Because the good is only given to us historically, making our political orientation never entirely stable, we must constantly redefine what we want to be lived in interaction with the world. And I think exactly this is what art is doing with us, right? It's challenging us to constantly redefine what we want and what we would like to be in engagement, in interaction um, with the world. So that I think, is, uh, that I take to be is the freedom of art, like freedom as an aesthetic value. Okay, so but before I make my argument, let me introduce a historic example that illustrates um, potential conflicts that 
my argument might face. So let's go back to South Africa and the Imbamba murals, which I briefly touched on before. Um, in 1989, the South African anti-apartheid activist Albi Sachs gave a very controversial paper delivered at an internal ANC workshop seminar on culture. The ANC, the abbreviation stands for African National Congress, is the ruling party in South Africa. Uh, fortunately, it was the ruling. Uh, it is the ruling party in South Africa since the end of apartheid in 1994. It was banned in South Africa from 1960 since its aims to unite all Africans, needless to say this included black Africans, conflicted with the main targets of the racial separation during the apartheid regime. And um, Sachs, which was like really progressive, like activist anti-apartheid, um, proposed the following um, idea, which seems very surprising given um, that he was so open-minded. So that's um, Albi Sachs. And the idea I'll introduce was um, part of the essay, Preparing Ourselves for Freedom. So Sachs, Sachs proposed there. The first suggestion I make is that our members should be banned from saying that culture is a weapon of struggle. I suggest a period of, say, five years. I make this suggestion even though I'm fully aware that the ANC is totally against censorship and for free speech. His reason for this demand was a belief that resistance art, or like kind of propagandistic art, impoverishes the artistic nature of an artwork. So he said, in the first place, it makes our art poorer. Instead of getting real criticism, we get solidarity criticism. So you might think here also of the um, artist Witt introduced, right, at the Biennale. So they might not get real uh, criticism facing the artistic nature of the artworks, but they might get the solidarity criticism, um, which is based on the content of the message they're conveying. That's Albi Sachs really rejected. So he continued saying, people do not feel free to criticize the work of our artists because it would be wrong to criticize a weapon of struggle. Therefore, our artists are not pushed to improve the quality of their work. We accept that they are politically correct, and so we do not criticize their work fully and honestly. So that's the danger of art as propaganda, right? If art conveys a message, we might not dare to criticize it because this might involve that we criticize its message. Um, but it might be really bad art, right, artistically. So a lot of art with introduced, right, from the Biennale, it's really like rubbish. I don't think it's art. Like it just plays with, uh, thrives on the idea that it's politically correct, and I think that's a problem. Okay, so um, I find this um, comparison then uh, Albi Sachs made really interesting because he said um, that his concern for the instrumentalization of art was um, due to the um, nature of the political struggle that would distract from art's real power, namely to alert us to aspects of light, life which are obviously not hidden. He said that a real weapon of struggle is a straightforward thing. A gun is a gun. It's a gun. There's no question about it. It fires only in one direction, similarly to political, uh, propagandistic art, right? Fire into one direction. But art and culture have a different kind of power. Art and culture can look in many different directions at once to show us things which are hidden to many different things of life, the many different things of life which are not clear-cut at all. That's why we can't say that art is a weapon in the same way that a gun is a weapon because art possesses in this ambiguity, right? If a uh, weapon would possess this ambiguity, that's really dangerous. <laughs> but art does, right? So rather than mourning the misery of the past, namely apartheid, um, art ought to sketch out a utopian vision of a brighter future. Sachs very much aligns here with what Achil Mbembe calls politics of anticipation. Interestingly, Sachs also aligns here with someone who is not typically known for promoting art, namely Plato. Plato rejected art for a reason that he resembled his detest of democracy, namely freedom. So I think if we want to defend art, we also need to defend its freedom. And um, that's what I'm trying to, go to do now. So Plato conceived of democracy as a problematic form of government, like almost the lowest form of government, since it features freedom as its supreme good. He was like terribly scared of freedom. Rather than being oriented towards the form of the good, the democratic polis resembled a democratic person, 
a person whose reason was not the sole governor but could be distracted by emotions and desires. Since art appeals to our non emotive desiderative aspects, Plato was skeptical of the arts too, since they might prevent people from independent critical thinking. Plato, in fact, only rejected the mimetic arts and not all forms of art. I think that's really, really important to make this distinction. Plato was concerned that the broad masses are easily misled by drones, and I find this um, quotation very um, topical, actually, when he talks about drones, which is, in fact, um, a symbol for demagogues, right? Like someone like Trump or so. Um, in Canada, because I'm already not allowed to travel to the U.S. anymore if I say these things. Um, when a younger man, Plato said in the Republic, who is reared in the miserly and uneducated manner we described, tastes the honey of the drones, so is kind of really influenced strongly by their propaganda, and associates with wild and dangerous creatures who can provide every variety of multicolored pleasure in every sort of way, this, as you might suppose, is the beginning of his transformation from having an oligarchic constitution within him to having a democratic one. So it's getting worse. So oligarchy was for him better than democracy for Plato. Um, if we think of current populist leaders, this worry is extremely justified. I mean, this worry about democracy. I just did a whole lecture series on the dangers of democracy and how we can save it. Um, Plato didn't believe that ordinary citizens were wise enough to integrate their desires into their rational parts. Therefore, he proposed an aristocratic leadership according to which the philosophers, knowledgeable of the form of the good, would determine the structure of the state in order to benefit everyone. However, in this vision of an ideal polis, Plato uses art himself. His Republic is in fact a piece of art in which he uses dialogue and friction to challenge his interlocutors to critical thinking. Plato so is himself actually an artist who uses the freedom of art to be political, to sketch out a political system, and he does this by not giving up this ambiguity. He has these dialogues which are never resolved, so if you read them, you have to think for yourself, and that's his kind of great achievement as an artist, that he doesn't give you a clearly defined political message, but he wants you to think for yourself, and I think this is also what art is doing. So towards the end of his life, Plato formulated the normoi, showing that trusting the philosophers would not suffice. Citizens require laws as guideline for individual decisions since the overall good is a too abstract category to be implemented. So and if the individuals need laws, they should maybe become lawgivers themselves. They should become autonomous. And I think only if we have these autonomous individuals, we can safeguard democracy. Because I think our current democracies are really under threat because of education failures. So people are not willing to accept that it's their responsibility to critically think for themselves. There's always this blame game. I always I hate this if people say, the politicians didn't do this. Well, you can do politics. You can become a politician. In fact, every one of us has the responsibility to be active and to be critical and exercise this criticality in the public discourse. And I think that's why it's also so great to have this forum here where we can like, kind of, in a way, exercise this democratic duty. So how should we do this? How should we and how sh can we use art or use or like kind of engage with art as a form of ongoing self-examination? Since the abstract moral laws, the idea of the good are to abstract, the citizen would require the capacity to make individual judgments. This requires a constitution of personal freedom that is constitutive for individual judgment. This personal freedom is no threat to the desires, but the task to make independent decisions. Again, art and democracy both force us to do so, since they both refuse to be conditioned by something clearly defined. And that's why um, I was really keen on making you read Juliane Rebentisch, because I think she brings forward a very sophisticated argument that allows us to see how we can safeguard democracy by engaging with the arts. So she highlights in her writing the link between, between freedom and art and democracy. So she says, the Democrat doesn't merely abandon his ch changing self-interpretations in the light of the prevailing self-image, rather he only exists in and through his self changing self-interpretations. Like a chameleon, he is constantly in flux. And 
just because of this being like constantly in flux, Plato was so scared of the arts because Plato um, wanted something, desired something, which is like fixed. Um, a system where everyone, every human being finds his or her ergon, like kind of the, the duty within the perfect state. But he was worried of something that's overstepping boundaries and challenging you to constantly define yourself anew. And exactly that is what art is doing with us, right? Like kind of a constant self-examination, self-questioning, but also self-development of one's kind of style, right? We will learn about, um, more about this from, from Nick later. Um, so Yulena Rehm just then continues in saying, this in turn means that acts of self-determination necessarily cure in the name of a self that does not exist prior to those acts, at least not as such. It's only through this act of self-determination that the subject brings itself to bear in this or that determination in order to then retroactively identify with this determination. Um, so while the characteristic of being in flux is what troubles um, Plato, Rebenter shows that it's actually an asset for determining oneself as a distinctive person who then possesses the virtues to engage in a public dialogue and an exchange with other perspectives. So one needs certain virtues in order to be able and um, to kind of give up this anxiety to take on new perspectives. I think this is also something involved in our current like, kind of political crisis that people have a lot of anxiety. You might um, know Martha Nussbaum's book, who, um, which is titled The Monarchy of Fear, in which she argues that because people are so anxious, they don't dare to take on new perspectives, um, which might be different to their own perspectives, so they rather stick to their viewpoints. And that's why art is so relevant in today's climate, because it forces us to really go beyond that, expand our, our limits, um, and yeah, think further. So um, my final section is called Art and Style, but I will not say much about um, style because Nick is doing this. Um, but I would like to argue that art is not only required to work towards a vision of a society, but also to um, work towards a vision of oneself. A part of the process of creating a vision for the future is the development of a unique style, a personality. Because only if we have this style, this personality, we are these kind of individual people that are able to engage in a dialogue with others because we dare to maybe abandon our perspective for a while to take on a new perspective. And that's also something Aldi Sachs promoted um, when he said, culture, it is is us, is, it is who we are, who, how we see ourselves and the vision we have of the world. When we make the culture of liberation, we make ourselves and remake ourselves. The culture of liberation is not just a question of the discipline of our organization and the relationships between the members of the organization. All organizations have these things, but our movement has developed a style of its own, a way of doing things and expressing itself, a particular ANC personality, so ANC African National Congress. So how do we then, then implement these political ideals and this kind of unique personal style in our everyday life? Um, and also in how we do this, I learned a lot from artists, namely an artist called Meliko Mogosi, whom I would love to introduce to you because I feel um, his engagement with these questions is so relevant and also shows again how much we can learn from practicing artists. So Meliko Mogosi, um, I met him in New York this February. We had a very long discussion when we met. I thought we would talk about his art or like kind of his new projects because this art series is called Democratic Intuition. So he's thinking about how art can um, engage viewers in thinking democracy further um, without having to subscribe to a clearly defined political message. And um, Meleko hinted me towards Axel Honneth, um, a philosopher, um, part of like, the Frankfurt School, um, who wrote the book Freedom's Rights, the Social Foundations of a Democratic Life, in which he argued that one of the major weaknesses of contemporary political philosophy is that it has been decoupled from an analysis of society, instead becoming fixated on a purely normative principle. This problem has a trajectory that harks back to Plato, whose prioritization of abstract normative principles made it difficult to assess how they ought to be implemented in everyday life. Plato's solution was to introduce laws in his late works as guidelines for actions. 
An alternative approach is to take aesthetics seriously as a realm for negotiation of how to implement between how um, to implement and negotiate between different conflicting demands. Conflicts and tension, Juliana Remtisch points out, are constitutive for the democratic culture of freedom. So this is precisely where the aesthetic sphere becomes crucial as a realm for a dissensus, for like a conflict, an argument, um, in which we can exercise how to engage with the experience of the ambiguous, the unfixed, and the changing. So this is a work by Malika Morgosi, which is part of his Democratic Intuition series. And I find it really interesting how he uses architecture in his work, um, because it relates back to basically early Renaissance um, predella paintings in which you have a narrative formulated in the predella, but um, Morgosi uses these fields, um, also these architectures to um, show different kind of time sets, but there's no narrative which combines them. And that, in, in doing that, he forces us to bring them together, to create something out of this friction that is inherent in the image, um, and we have to make kind of a narrative ourselves by engaging with these multiple different perspectives. So in a way, art serves you as a public platform for discourse in order to engage with different kinds of ideas. So similar to the sculpture park here, basically, right? So where we are confronted with multiple perspectives and are engaging with them by walking around them, by kind of trying to understand a certain perspective, stepping back, going to a different perspective and engaging with it. That's basically the discourse, the dialogue, also Plato desired in a perfect kind of state in which we have constant negotiation. But what he didn't understand is that art is actually allowing us to do this, yeah? so that we can't only do this through verbal dialogue. Um, and um, that's why I find like Malika's work extremely interesting, especially if we read it again backdrop of a book called Aesthetic Democracy, um, which was written by um, Thomas Doherty. And here he argues that the cultural event allows us um, to see the potential for freedom is therefore constitutive for democracy. So he says that aesthetic democracy then is based upon the potentiality of democracy. First, it's linked to the metaphysics of going beyond. So exactly what we read earlier on in Jeffrey Rubinoff's statement, right? That art is going beyond the limits. Art is constantly kind of stretching our freedom further. And that's something which Doherty um, views as really um, significant for a co current climate. I mean, he anticipated it because the book was published in 2006 of democratical crises, right? Where we don't have stable democracies anymore. Where more and more democracies are taken over by populist politicians, politicians which use like strategies from propaganda, like that's why I'm against artist propaganda, um, in order to infiltrate people. Because it's no longer about this independent critical thinking taking on new perspectives, but it's about a clearly formulated singular perspective. So, um, Maliko Magosi like, kind of takes this idea of democracy um, in the aesthetic realm, this aesthetic democracy seriously, and I wanted to show you a couple more artworks because he's doing exactly this. He's confronting us with scenes from everyday life in South Africa. He himself is from Botswana, which is kind of north of South Africa, but obviously very much linked to the history of South Africa. But these are scenes from everyday life. He is interested in asking how can democratic intuitions be implemented in everyday reality. He doesn't want to show us like kind of big fighters for democracy, people who died for democracy, um, who are unique. He really wants us to become aware that democracy is only striving if everyone in a democracy is subscribing to this like democratic intuition. So in his art, he's trying out um, how Axel Honneth's ideas of freedom can be implemented in the singular artworks. And he then, by um, setting all the scenes in friction in kind of the panels, um, he wants us to make our own kind of dialogue, establish an own dialogue with the artworks in which we can then negotiate in what this freedom consists in. So maybe I show you a couple. Do I have to do more time? Show a couple. Yeah, maybe we can do one more. Okay, great. Okay.
Yeah, so, so this is one of the panels, um, a, a part of this democratic intuition series that was like exhibited at Stevenson Gallery in South Africa. So the, um, the series started in 2009 and was completed in 2019, so 10 years and just about completed, and it was exhibited in um, galleries in South Africa, in New York, um, and um, in some museums in the U.S., like kind of um, touring around. And um, Meliko there brought together the scenes from everyday life, but also wondered about the question how art has been, I mean, maybe this goes too far, but he was also concerned about the commodification of art, right? So why um, we identify with an artwork only of, as an object of desire, like that fulfills our kind of needs for consumption. Um, but in these years, this democratic intuition, it was really about engaging us with the new concept of time. That's why I brought you the Predella painting to show that while we have like kind of a narrative which is progressing here, which is linear, right, where people who could not read at that time were confronted with like kind of biblical narratives in order to understand them through the visual because they couldn't read. Um, and there's a coherent singular narrative, namely the narrative which was supposed to be conveyed, like the church wanted to convey this. And Meliko refuses to um, still subscribe to this concept of time, of this linear time frame. He rather is interested in concepts, African concepts of philosophy and African concepts of time and space. I mean, as, as you might know, with reference to Immanuel Kant, um, in our Western philosophy, we couldn't live without these concepts of time and space as certain frames for intuition in order to perceive things. And Meleko Mogosi thinks that um, given that in African philosophy we don't have this concept of time, we would have to um, establish a whole new um, context of frame, a context of time in order to understand what they want to communicate. So in a way, if we still stick to our Western perspective, we will never fully understand and comprehend the content of these works because they really require us to abandon our um, traditional categories of time and space. And that's why um, he counterposes um, these ideas so, um, and causes there be this friction for us to not being able to read that. Um, also his work, it's really interesting because it um, displays an emptiness in kind of private environment. So Mel Meleko Mogosi is deeply concerned that especially in South Africa, we don't have a public sphere any longer. Um, as you might recall from Jürgen Habermas, a German philosopher who argued um, in order to have a functioning democracy, we need a public sphere in which we can have a public discourse, a dialogue. And by this, um, showing us like kind of these individuals who are on their own in environments which are fenced off by the curtains, so there's no exchange between the private interior and the outside, the public, um, the individuals get more and more isolated and withdrawn into the private. There's no political discourse anymore. So that's not a clearly defined political message, but it's a very subtle demand for leaving the private sphere again and entering the public sphere in order to make a dialogue possible and in order to sustain what's so um, crucial to democratic functioning. Yeah, so that's another work um, in which he shows an individual, probably one um, individual living in a kind of township environment, because it's an um, impoverished scene, it's not like kind of this lavish grandeur curtain. And he also criticizes then the um, problem of corruption among the ANC um, itself, right? Like the ANC as party, like Nelson Mandela's party, which used to thrive on these utopian visions for freedom. The reality is different today, right? It's kind of partly a corrupt party, um, which also desires these capitalist kind of vision of what freedom might be, namely if one is kind of yeah, satisfied by consumer um, capitalism. That's why he has these like, kind of woman, which is obviously quite well off in a Mondrian style abstract framing. Um, I found very interesting. Okay, so maybe we can discuss some of the works later on. And also, I think I really would like to hear your thoughts on whether we should think of freedom as an aesthetic value and no longer um, as a political value. But um, let me just kind of wrap up and then we can start the discussion. So. Rather than medi medita mediating a propagandistic message, 
Art engagement could initiate a process of engaging with multiple perspectives and self-reflection, reflection, hence a process leading to truth. Truth involves constant self-examination. If art promotes this due to its openness that it shares with the democratic process, Plato would certainly see some value of it. Due to art's nature to open up a realm of freedom that's crucial for the experience of democracy, all art is political to a certain extent. But this political nature should not manifest itself in content, propaganda, but in art's freedom. If freedom is a core aesthetic value, then art is certainly also free to be political. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I, I loved the, this, the idea that, the, that art can stimulate this different perspective and in this very notion of freedom and exchange and negotiating perspective is kind of like a model in a way. Is that, that mm -hmm. sounds right? Off, like what can happen in democracy? Like maybe, I mean, I quite would like to sort of try out this system where we give like the audience like two minutes maybe mm -hmm. to just like talk, talk amongst yourself and talk to your neighbor about, you know, whether you found these ideas convincing, whether you found something in the presentation that you particularly want to address or ask a question about, or indeed more broadly how you think this might relate to artworks that you study or the artworks that you see around yourself. So... Just two minutes of discussion, and then we'll take it to to Sarah's questions. Yeah. All right. So we're going to um, reassemble our thoughts, and um, we'll take a few a few questions. We've got like sort of like eight eight nine minutes before we break for coffee. So um, yeah, do I do I have any hands? Be brave. Yes, Patricia. Uh, my name is Pat. Um, I thought I heard, oh, this was a wonderful talk and very stimulating, um, but I thought I heard you say at the end that content is propaganda. Or were you saying, I just wonder if you could clarify what you were saying because clearly content can be so many things yeah, and, it, it, and it's so big. Um, but so if we turn it around and say propaganda um, is propaganda by virtue of its content, you know, yeah, I, think I would agree. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think what I meant was a clearly defined message as content, so I think there are um, a variety of forms of content, and it's not that a specific content then would kind of operate as propaganda, but I think if an artwork has like a, an advertisement, a poster, like which clearly intends to make you buy the product, right? If it has just one singular content, one singular message, then for me it's not an artwork because an artwork always possesses ambiguity. Um, it's maybe a very problematic definition of an artwork, but I think the definition of an artwork would lose something if we let go of this ambiguity, because I think this is what makes art so exciting and also challenging, right, and forces you to engage with it critically, because it doesn't have like a clear defined message like an advertisement poster or right. something. Right, and it means that it invites the individual to have a variety of responses. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. No, I totally agree. I just yeah. wanted to make sure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, Arash. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, in your abstract, you write that uh, the political nature of life can impact on all realms of life. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what is the reason that you think all of life, all of life is political? Okay, so... And how do you define that? Yes, so I think um, there are certain virtues, like, for example, virtues that lead to the implementation of freedom, right, that are maybe moral virtues, but that are transferable to the political realm. So I think that basically the political <coughs> virtues we need in order to be a citizen, like a democratic citizen, um, are part of a constitution that we are ourselves, right? So like kind of that has to do something with the distinctive style. So we can then transfer these virtues to different realms, to the political realm, to the moral realm, to the aesthetic realm. Um, and that's why I think there's this overlap and we can't clearly separate between what's political and what's, say, moral. Because we are always living in communities. So that's a very broad definition of the political. It's not tied to being part of a specific party. But I think just by kind of living in a community, a society, we are already participating in like something political. 
Could you maybe give an example of that kind of a virtue that you're talking about? So, you know, you said like there's a, there are certain virtues which obtain in the aesthetic realm, in the moral realm, in the political realm. What's an example of a virtue like that? Yeah, maybe like kind of a virtue would be attentiveness, right? So um, in order to understand an artwork, you need to attend to it, right? You can't just rush to a museum. Like I often see this, people just taking selfies, like photo, next photo. So that's not an engagement with the, con like the aura of an artwork, if you still believe in aura or something, um, because you need to be attentive to understand the work. And that's something like a virtue that is transferable to the political realm. In order to understand the complexity of a political problem, you need to be attentive to it. You need to engage with it. Similarly, in the moral realm, you can't make a quick decision of some, whether something counts as a good or a bad action. You need to be attentive to it. So I, that would be maybe one virtue. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much for your paper. I really enjoyed it. But my only doubt, my only question is I can think of lots of artworks that were created with relatively unambiguous messages, uh, from whether religious artworks or the sculptures on the path and on. And at the same time, I can also think of lots of works of propaganda, or a few works of propaganda, that I think are very great artworks on their own terms, despite their messages. So I just... I think, I think Lenny Riefenstahl's, uh, both of her films are... Uh, extraordinary technical and formal accomplishments. Yeah, but nothing more, right? Like, they are technical and formal, but would you count them as artworks, like Leni Riefenstahl? We go always back to I think, I think, I think, I think, I think my, no, I think my, I think, I think you've got quite a, quite a strict definition of what art is, and you're excluding uh, things that, you know, you may not agree with, but they might still, well, Garnica, you could, yeah. Let's, let's use the uh, Korean War, like Picasso's Korean War, because I also think that's not a good artwork, okay. even though it's a Picasso. But I think it's too clear in its message, right? It's a too clear statement against this specific war. War again, like with Guernica, it's much more ambiguous. So for me, that's not um, Guernica is not a propagandistic artwork because it possesses this openness, and there's a new kind of way of experiencing with forms, with the language, with the artistic language. Whereas I feel like Picasso's Korean War is kitsch. So it's, and also propaganda, so for me, not a good artwork. So it may be an artwork because of the institutional theory, because Picasso is kind of an acknowledged artist, but it's a bad artwork. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the, d the debate yeah. about whether something's good or bad, but I was just, I, uh, you know, it was the question about whether something ceases to be art because it's not ambiguous. Yeah, I mean, I, think, I do think it does cease to be art if it's not ambiguous. I really do, because I think also the good artworks which are like kind of religious art, like Piero del Francesco, for example, there's something in it which contains this ambiguity. It's not that he says, you have to believe this and this and this. So it's still playful. There's something going on in your mind if you look at it. So maybe ambiguity in a smaller sense than with a non-religious work or so. Okay, so I've got um, Karun and then a few more questions here. Yeah. Sure. The first thing I wanted to mention is we forgot at the beginning of this to, to mention that we really do want the students to feel free to jump in with whatever questions or comments you have, as well as the observers in the back and our staff and volunteers. So please don't feel intimidated. We're, it, I know that things are flying back and forth. Sometimes also you gentlemen may be not be able to see this corner of the room. So, so wave your hand up. We do want to get your comments. So maybe, um, shall, we, shall we see if there's a, you've already had one, uh, shall we see if, there's, if there are any questions from the students or our guests we, who, who haven't spoken yet? It's okay if you Yeah, don't okay, Mona, it. Mona, why don't we get a question from Mona, please. Um, I'm not quite sure if I agree with your um, just recent statement. Um, so is that what you're saying is that if a message is quite clear and not ambiguous, that's not good art, and the more you complicate the reading, the better the art becomes? Is, is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's the message. And if so, um, then if, if you're thinking about that um, Habermasian statement of bringing everything to the public sphere and discuss it. Uh, and if you if you consider um, the subjectivity of the artist and the subjectivity of the viewer, then bringing that into the public sphere and discussing it, even if the message is also clear, um, there is still a discussion. But 
I mean, in, in let's say in, in today's world, if that discussion won't be public sphere, if if, the, if it's still virtual public sphere, if you were to just Google it and you're curious to see what the hell that is, that's still bringing it to public sphere, and that's still um, touching upon the phenomenal, phenomenological aspect of kind of like informing yourself and whether you're you're you agree with that particular p propaganda or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, uh, first, of, first of all, thanks for disagreeing. I love that because I hate if people agree. Um, and that's exactly... That's exactly your point. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly... <laughs> my... <laughs> no, so, I mean, obviously the public sphere doesn't need to be a realm which is kind of a platonic agora, right? It can happen in the virtual. Um, and I think with this ambiguity, I'm not saying that it mustn't have a message in artwork, um, but it still needs to have something else. So something that maybe engages your creativity, maybe a develop, new development of like kind of formal language or kind of um, some inspiration that goes or like kind of inspires you to go beyond your limits. That's what I mean with this freedom, right? Or like kind of you would talk in Kantian sense about this kind of playfulness, right? This kind of free play. Um, and I think this is working so well, much better, I think that was your other question, in the aesthetic realm than in a verbal dialogue because it has a strong aesthetic component. And I think um, if something is aesthetic, it always is ambiguous because, as you said, you bring in your subjectivity to a certain extent and the other person brings in their kind of subjectivity. So it's difficult to arrive at something entirely objective. And maybe that's it's the ambiguity. So 